This is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. You are insane. And Big Anklevich. No, you're insane. Ahoy, hoy. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And thank you for joining us. Lock up your wives and daughters. Announcer Man is here. Hey, Announcer Man. Unfortunately, CYADRG couldn't be with us again this week. Oh, you're kidding. I dug that guy. Yeah, I know you did. Oh, please, please don't tell me ROGT is back. No, ROGT is actually still out of town. Oh, okay, uh, uh, So we don't have stuff. any robot here. We actually today. do have a robot here to take care of things for us because oh. seriously, production would slip a lot if we left that in your hands. Nice one. Actually, you're going to like this. I highly doubt that. Because this guy with us today is someone that uh, you've probably heard of before. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure you're a fan of. Sitting in the producer desk today is none other than Soundwave from Transformers fame. Hello, Big and Rich. Nice to be on the show. Good to have you. Wait, you're kidding. So- how did you get Soundwave? Dude, dude, I, I gotta tell you, I'm I'm a huge, huge fan. Thank you. No, 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 no. I of all the Transformers, uh, you were my absolute favorite. Thank, Thank you. you. I had your toe. You were the first Transformer I had. You, I asked for. Thank you. you. No, I asked for you. Well, I mean, not not you, obviously, but the the toy version of you. It's just so weird to actually be in the same room as you. I, I hear. It's kind of interesting, huh? It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's good to have you. Wow. How did you manage to get Soundwave in here on this? Well, <laughs> turns out, you know, ever since the original series has been over, he really hasn't had much work. I mean, they came out with a lot of Beast Wars crap, and then Michael Bay just anal raped the whole franchise. and Affirmative. You know, it was pretty bad. So he's basically uh, working for the same temp agency as uh, CYADRG now. Well, hey, I'm I'm sorry that you're on hard times, but uh, it is just a thrill to have you here. And, and uh, if you weren't so damn big, I would take your hand. And <laughs> yeah, speaking of that, you know, I've always wondered, Soundwave, how is it that you're so damn big when you transform into a friggin' tape recorder that fits into my palm? What's the deal with that? The stainless steel construction of my corporeal form mixed with energon. Oh, okay, right. come on, no, seriously. Trade secrets. Uh... Hasbro has sworn us all to secrecy. Great. <sighs> Anyways, at least he can push buttons as well as Oedo T does, so there's that. Uh, way better than Oedo T. Oedo T is a personal friend of mine. Oh. He would have made a fine Decepticon. Oh, okay, I agree with you there, man. Yeah. Oh, what would he have transformed into? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, wasn't Oedo T at your bar mitzvah? Or was that Optimus Prime? So I forget which one of you guys is Jewish. Optimus is of the chosen people, yes. Ah. Uh, Okay. And, and and what are you, Soundwave, if you don't mind us asking? I'm more of a non-denominational. <laughs> okay, well... Shouldn't we start on the story now? No, no, no. We're in no rush, right? Well, I don't know. The author might get irritated if he's got to listen through 20 minutes of pre-story stuff. Okay, well, if the author has any taste at all, he is also a fan of Soundwave. I mean, some things never go out of style. <laughs> I, I'm sure that you will be... Back on top once again. Just like uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Johnny Depp, those guys that later in life, the real stardom hits. Yeah, maybe. I don't Thank know, you. though. I wonder if the fact that he's a cassette player might be hindering his... Listen, can, can we, we not, not talk, talk about, about that? that? Can, can I, I just, just play, play the story, story please? please? All right, we'll move on to the story. Sorry about that. I need to hurt your feelings. Sound wave. Okay, so today's story is uh, Hang Up and Try Again by Derek L. Palmer. Derek L. Palmer works as a software technician, a job he is wholly unqualified for, at a Culver City dental products company when he isn't maintaining the computers of people with intimidatingly white teeth. He fancies himself as a writer of horror and urban fantasy stories. His work has been heard on the Doonstief before, recently in our anti-Valentine's Day story, and most notably in our very first episode, which you probably still haven't listened to. We'd like to thank Michael Eliau, Lizanne Hurd, Julie Hoverson, and Abigail Hilton for lending their voices to today's episode. Today's music is Way Too Much by Leslie Hunt, and you can check out all the links in the show notes. Hang Up and Try Again by Derek L. Palmer. 
Afton Dahlquist is now 30, a wife and mother living in Linden, Utah. She is a piano teacher, a Cub Scout den leader, a church organist, and has a content, comfortable life. She stays busy, whether quilting, taking the boys to their t-ball and soccer classes, the girls to gymnastics and swimming, a series of foreign language on tape courses, cooking for the shut-ins in her neighborhood, an online baby blanket selling site that never quite gets off the ground, Deseret Industries drives, and endless vacation plans with her husband. But she hasn't gotten too busy to think about the magic of her youth. Every once in a while, when she sees a payphone or hears the right kind of ring on the television, she is brought back to the days when she was 16 and the mall turned especially magical. Afton McCarthy loved to go to the mall. There was always something new there, a sale to look into, something to buy, something to plan to buy, something to dream of buying. There were cute boys sometimes, but mostly it was an exciting social place where sometimes they saw people they knew or made friends with an employee at Bead Connection or Musicland or ZCMI. Even alone, there was something magical about the place. The very smell of the mall made Afton smile. Since she'd gotten her driver's license in October, the University Mall had been her major destination. School was in session and she didn't have a car of her own, so she looked forward to Saturdays with the intensity of a prison furlough candidate. She and her best friend, Brenda Beck, went every Friday or Saturday, even if they had no money or interest in shopping. It was a place to go and people watch, or pretend they were someone else, or just be free of parents. It had been three weeks, though, and Afton was itching to get back. They had missed last week because Brenda was grounded, and the week before because Afton was getting her braces off. So this Saturday was the day. Unfortunately, Stephen, Afton's 13-year-old brother and always mom's favorite, had somehow convinced her to make Afton take him along. He wants to go to the card shop and play video games. Mom told her as if it were a completely reasonable request. Afton's teeth ground together. Stephen's gross, Mom. He'll embarrass me. Just go your separate ways when you arrive, Mom suggested. Then pick them up when you want to go home. Afton moaned. Ugh. But, Mom, I did. Wait a minute. Them? Who else had wormed their way into this scenario? Who's them? I told Steve he could go if he scored better on his science test. An F plus is still an F. Mom ignored her. He asked if he could take Mark along, and I said he could. Mark Penrod, while not as geeky as Stephen, was nervous and gangly, and she got the impression he was always undressing her in his mind. I hate Mark, Afton said, though that wasn't totally true. Why don't you drive them? Mom took off her glasses and rubbed her nose. Between her fingers, she gave Afton what she and Brenda referred to as the stink eye. Because you'll be borrowing the car to go to the mall. Whoops. Or am I wrong about that? Something in Mom's tone suggested Afton was about to lose her driving privileges for the weekend. No, no, I'll take them. But please, tell him not to be too dorky. Mom sighed and nodded. Certainly. Whatever that means. So it was on a Saturday afternoon that Afton drove north to Provo, her best pal Brenda acting as co-pilot with Stephen and Mark jabbering in the back seat. Afton had physically threatened Stephen if he was anything less than invisible on the trip. And while he had told her to get out of his face, he had agreed to stay far away from the girls. At five o'clock, Afton and Brenda would meet them at the video arcade and head home from there. Stephen was being something of a butt, though not more than usual. Mark kept tugging at Brenda's seatbelt. Either he was trying to choke her, or he liked the way it pulled her t-shirt tight against her chest. Either way, the girls couldn't wait to be at the mall. And when they got there, Afton parked in the first spot she found, not bothering to find a space close to her preferred entrance by the food court. Five o'clock, she reminded her brother as he and Mark took off to do who knows what. 
He grunted a reply, but was happy enough to be there that he seemed almost pleasant. University Mall was as much fun as ever. Afton and Brenda wandered high and low through the big department stores to the tiny out-of-the-way shops, almost like they were on a scavenger hunt. They split an orange Julius, looked for a card in the Hallmark store. Afton bought some sheet music at Burt Murdoch, glanced at the Tom Cruise posters at Prince Plus, and cooed at the cute little glass deer at Crystal Creations. Brenda tried on nearly every size 6 shoe the mall had to offer, and Afton almost bought some neon blue earrings that she probably wouldn't have worn much anyway had she bought them. The girls had a laugh at a cute boy who was winking at Brenda, then nearly died when his mother came out of Deseret Book and told him not to wander off. Before they knew it, it was 10 to 5, and Afton and Brenda made it to the far corner of the mall where the arcade was. It was a large, underlit connection of game-lined rooms on two levels, and was filled with noisy, loud, and or obnoxious boys. Afton found Mark sitting in a mock jet cockpit. She tactfully waited until he crashed and burned before asking him where Stephen was. Round here somewhere, he said, looking at his watch with a frown. I saw him a minute ago. Brenda motioned Afton over where Stephen was playing Smash TV with a greasy, long-haired kid. Time to go. She said. No, it isn't. Afton frowned. Technically, he was right. Besides, her brother was... Almost at the end of this level. Whatever that meant. Five minutes. Afton said, impressing Brenda with her patience. No problem. If he makes us late, that'll guarantee my mom will never make me bring him again. They wandered around for a minute or two, looking at the games and the boys playing them. It all seemed pretty boring to Afton. And the boys all seemed pretty nerdy to Brenda. At the back of the arcade, Brenda heard female giggling. She and Afton turned to see a pair of girls around their age chattering excitedly to one another. They looked to be freaking out. Suddenly they broke into a run, expressions of joy on their faces. We gotta tell Sandra about this, one said as they ran by. Afton was curious and walked over to the darkened corner where they had been giggling. Four machines sat there, a blinking, faded joust, an out-of-order pinball machine, a payphone, and a lonely-looking video bowling game. Afton got closer, seeing that the payphone wasn't really a payphone, but another game, made up to look like a phone booth. It had a seat inside and a phone receiver, but no touch numbers to dial. There was a slot for quarters right inside the booth. She was looking at a video game, or something very much like one, called Magic Phone Booth. It was quite stupid looking, with a curtain like a photo booth, and a drawing of a wizard holding out a phone and exclamation marks coming out of it. She should have ran away right then, corralled her brother by the ear, and headed home. But instead, she stuck her head in the booth. There was a small screen inside, not as big as the ones inside video games, flashing insert coin. Under it, block letters said, three minute conversation with anyone, anywhere. Colorful images moved across the screen showing various cartoon people talking on the phone. One said, Hello, Michelle. Another said, Hello, Elvis. Another said, Hello, Bigfoot. Afton saw Brenda standing next to her. Do you want to play it? I don't even know how. But it looked straightforward enough. Brenda had a quarter, two in fact, and handed one to her friend. Could be fun, she said. But Brenda was always saying that, whether it was about sneaking out or swiping stuff or leading boys on. What, should I call Tom Cruise or something? Afton asked, about to return the quarter. As soon as she said it, though, she thought it could be pretty funny. So, as a lark, Afton got in the booth. She placed the coin in the slot, and down it went. As soon as the coin was gone, a jolly five-second tune played. Insert coin became, pick up the phone. Afton did so. A crude image of the wizard from the outside of the phone booth came on screen and a message blinked below it. The text on the screen said, Please tell the magic phone wizard who you wish to call. Be specific. At that, Afton was more skeptical than ever, but it didn't stop her from saying, Uh, Tom Cruise, star of Top Gun. As soon as she was done speaking, she heard several electronic beeps, the same kind you heard any time you had an operator dial a number for you. Then a ringtone, and another. Hello? A friendly, youthful voice answered. Afton smiled at the trick. Tom? Speaking. Tom Cruise? Sure. Who's this? Afton was going to answer, 
then gave it a little thought. If someone really called Tom Cruise's number, would he just pick up like that? Surely he had secretaries or answering machines or assistants or something. She asked, Where are you right now, Tom? I'm in Malibu. Th that's in California, right? Right. How did you get this number? Did I call you at home? Sorry. She said, though she was not sorry in the slightest. This was great. It's no biggie. He told her, though she'd never known a real person to use the word biggie. I just wanted to tell you that I've had a crush on you since I was eight years old. Thank you. Thank you very much. He said, though it sounded pretty rehearsed. I bet you hear that all the time. I... <laughs> he chuckled. <laughs> From time to time, yeah. But it's always nice to hear. Thank you. Wow, he was really polite. You know what movie of yours I love that nobody ever talks about? What? Born on the 4th of July. That was so sad. Yes, that was a good one. Oliver Stone, thank you. You're welcome. What's your name? Afton. Afton, I sort of need to go. I've got some people over. Afton was tremendously disappointed. Girls? No, there are some friends from out of town. But I appreciate the nice things you told me. You're the best actor in the world, she said, though it sounded stupid to her own ears. Thank you, Afton. Well, bye. Bye. And he hung up. Afton hung up the phone, too. Brenda put her hands on her hips like the models do. Well? Well, I think that was really Tom Cruise. She felt a bit tingly right now. How do you know? That was true. She hadn't asked for proof. But then she just knew. I recognized his voice. Wow. Brenda said, not quite believing. It's a trick, right? It should be, but... But Afton didn't know how it could work. It wasn't a recording or anything. Well, maybe it's an impressionator. A what? You know, maybe... Brenda thought aloud. Maybe there's a bunch of operators standing by who do a bunch of celebrity voices. And when you say the right one, a light comes up on the screen in front of them and they pretend to be him. Afton thought about it. There might be so many requests to talk to Tom Cruise that it was programmed in there. But that seemed doubtful. How many girls are there who play video games, though? Brenda looked around the arcade. There were a couple of females there, but most of them were mothers or very young children. The giggling teens that got them into the corner were gone. She didn't feel like giving it much thought. Besides, she wanted to believe in the magic phone booth, or at least give it a try. Okay, my turn, Brenda said. She hopped into the phone booth like she was strapping herself into a bumper car. She chose to call Mr. Prunty, the high school vice principal. There was nobody that didn't hate him, but he didn't seem to suspect it was a prank call at first. As Brenda said flirty, vague things like, Don't you recognize my voice? And, It's been too long. It wasn't until she called him, Mr. Prunty, that he caught on. He demanded to know who was speaking, and Brenda, in a moment of inspiration, said, Listen closely. Then somehow generated a huge, manly locker room belch. <laughs> it was revolting. No wonder all the boys were crazy about her. She hung up the phone and they both giggled like the girls who drew them there. 25 cents well spent. This is awesome, Brenda said, and Afton wasn't about to argue. As Brenda ran over to the change maker to get more quarters, Afton discovered she had one in her pocket. She got a rather unusual idea. When the machine asked her to tell it who she wanted to call, she said, Brenda Beck of Praised in Utah. She laughed after she said it but stopped laughing when the rings were cut off by Brenda's phone-distorted voice. Hello? It was unmistakable. Even so, Afton said, Brenda? Uh-huh. Aft, is that you? It is, but I... <sighs> she looked around. Brenda was not nearby. How is this possible? What do you mean? I mean... She stretched her head out of the booth, and there was Brenda halfway across the arcade trying to get the machine to accept her dollar. I mean, where are you? Nowhere. Where are you? At the mall. Lucky, why didn't you take me? She was tempted to tell her that she did, but didn't want to waste the minutes. She wanted proof that this was her best friend. Answer me a question, Brent. Shoot. What's the worst thing you ever did? The girl on the phone cleared her throat <laughs> in an adorable way, of course. What's this about, Afton? 
Aspen didn't know how much to say. I'm just wondering, when was the last time you stole something? Stole? You mean from a store? Phone Brenda asked. You know that. You were with me. Tell me. After don't lay a guilt trip, okay? No guilt. Just tell me. It was a blue blouse. I tried it on in the fitting room and didn't take it off. Put my coat on over it. That's right. A, a penny. Afton said, deliberately getting it wrong. It was Mervyn's, actually. But I told you that it was a dumb thing to do. Did I tell you Demi Valet got caught shoplifting and they actually took her to the police station? They got her prints and everything. No, you didn't tell me. Afton said, absolutely blown away by this. But have you told anyone else about the blue blouse? Brenda on the phone sounded exasperated. No, you know I haven't. Afton thought of an experiment, something that could be hilarious for later on. Okay, tell me something else you've never told anyone, not even me. What do you mean? Just do it, Brenda. Suddenly, a blonde, ponytailed head stuck itself into the booth with her. Did you say my name? Brenda asked, smiling. Instantly, Afton hung up the phone, feeling unexplainably embarrassed. It was as if she'd been caught, or almost caught, reading somebody's diary. Uh, no, I, um, I just... Who were you talking to? Uh, the president. Afton lied. Though that would be a pretty neat conversation to have. Wow. Brenda said, not even considering that her friend would be lying. Afton tried to be impeccably honest. Did he tell you anything interesting? Not really. Afton changed the subject. Hey, Brent, have you heard anything interesting about Demi? Demi Volet? Then Brenda remembered something. Oh, yeah! Oh, I forgot to tell you! The cops picked her up last week. Week before last, actually. She was stealing CDs and they caught her. They got her prints and everything. Afton was almost giddy with excitement. She hugged her friend with delight. Whoa, I thought you liked Demi. Forget Demi. Did you get quarters? I got four. She held them out. I was thinking it might be neat to call my cousin Jen. I haven't talked to her in like three years. No, no, you could call her from a regular phone. Let's call people we never could speak to without magic. Like the Queen of England or someone in a band. Right, right. Brenda started to think. She didn't really have any ideas. She couldn't think of any heroes either. Somebody like the Queen of England. Maybe that lady who got her head cut off for, you know, saying let them eat cake. Marie Antoinette? Okay, go right ahead. Brenda raised her eyebrows. Wait, do you have a better idea? She was trying. I wonder how specific you have to be. What if I said I want to talk to the cutest boy in the world? Brenda grinned. Her eyes sparkled. Oh my god, do it, Afton. Afton hopped back into the booth. Then she hopped out to get a quarter from her friend. She told the machine, I want to speak to the handsomest 18-year-old boy in the whole world. There was a dial tone, then several beeps as the connection was being made, then a click. Afton's heart started to pound in her chest. A male voice answered the phone. Hello? Afton said, Hello? Hello? The voice said again. I sounded a little like, Hello? Hi, who's this? Qu'est-ce que vous avez dit? The boy was speaking French or something. Do you speak English? Afton asked. Uh, non, je sais seulement trois quatre mots. What's your name? Je suis désolé, je ne parle pas anglais. Vous parlez français? Ou italien, non? Afton sighed into the phone. This wouldn't work at all. <sighs> no, I need you to speak to me in English. I'm wasting a quarter. Je suis désolé, mon père parle un peu anglais, mais il n'est pas à la maison. C'est dommage, vous semblez mignonne. Afton swore under her breath. She had no idea what he was saying. Probably something about ugly Americans polluting the airwaves. I gotta go, she said and hung up the phone. Brenda stared at her, a line of sympathy on her flawless brow. Afton had a pimple and a half on hers, though she'd hidden it fairly well with makeup. He didn't speak English? Guess I should have been more specific. Too bad. You could have really hit it off. Was that possible? Could she have maybe gotten him to send her a letter or a picture? How did you ask someone you'd already called for their number? Suddenly, Brenda's eyes lit up. She started to do a cute little dance by the booth. Though she didn't see it, Afton knew at least three boys nearby had just suddenly hit puberty. I know who I want to call, she announced. Afton slid out of the booth and Brenda hopped into her place. Brenda popped a coin in the slot, then patted the seat beside her. Sit. Afton, curious, squeezed in next to her. 
The instructions on the screen let Brenda know the conditions of the game. Though it wasn't really a game, was it? More like a miracle. I want to speak, Brenda said, pausing for effect. She was blushing, the brilliance of her idea turning her face into a shiny, ripe strawberry. To my future husband, after we're married. Afton's mouth fell open. For a gorgeous but dumb cheerleader, that was brilliant. Afton sure hadn't thought of it. The phone rang and both girls tingled with excitement. A man said, Hello, Campbells. Brenda found herself momentarily speechless. On the other end of the line, if the machine was still working, was the man she'd be spending the rest of her life with. She got an elbow from her best friend and quickly managed to... Hello? Brenda, honey, is that you? Brenda froze. This couldn't be happening, could it? The man's voice came again. Brenda, are you there? I'm here, honey. It's just that I... uh... Is anything wrong? No, no, nothing, nothing wrong. Brenda looked at Afton. Can you believe this? Afton smiled back. No, can you? Did you forget something? Future man was asking. Forget? No, I didn't. I I just wanted to hear your voice. That's sweet of you, Brand. Figured there was something wrong since I just saw you, what, ten minutes ago? Where did you see me? Here. Or, or do you mean what room? I mean, what town? Town? The man sounded confused. Brenda, is, is this a joke? Brenda looked at Afton again. What should I say? Afton nodded theatrically. Yes, tell him it's a joke. Yes, yes, a, a joke. Just humor me, okay? Well, I... What town do we live in? Then, giving emphasis. Honey? We live in Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona? Brenda couldn't believe it. She'd never even been to Arizona. She hated hot weather. Oh, Phoenix, Minnesota, the man responded, getting impatient. I didn't know there was a Phoenix, Minnesota, Brenda told Afton. Afton shook her head. And how many kids do we have? One. Why? Did you find out different? He laughed. (laughs) Is that why you're calling like this? Brenda was completely dumbfounded. How could her husband not know how many kids they had? Was he, what was the word, estranged? Afton rolled her eyes. He thinks he might be pregnant. Pregnant? Brenda whispered. That means we've been having sex. Afton rolled her eyes again, bigger. Married couples do that, she said. Then she added, Well, except for my mom and dad. I can't believe it. Brenda whispered, her hand still over the phone. Afton wasn't sure how much time had passed, but Brenda was burning a lot of daylight. Talk to him. Oh, 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 yeah. Into the phone, she put on her sweetest boy-manipulating voice. Honey, how much do you love me? I love you a great deal, he said, still sounding confused. But Brenda didn't notice that. She noticed his choice of words. What an unromantic way of phrasing things. Could she have married a geek or a scientist or something? What's this about? And are we happy together? Yes, I'd say we're happy. Well, I'm happy, sure. Brenda? He kept saying her name. And do you think I'm beautiful? Brenda, you know I do. What is going on? Honey? Brenda said, ignoring him. What kind of car do I drive? Before he could answer, Afton leaned in. Find out his name. Brenda nodded. Good idea. Honey, what's your name? My name. Did I do something wrong? Brenda scowled. What was this guy's problem? And what did he look like? And what year was it there? No, I just, I just want to know. Sweetheart, you're scaring me. Don't be scared. Brenda looked at her friend for some kind of suggestion. When Afton only shrugged, she figured she'd use the tried and true. Uh... If you'll just play along with me, I'll give you a reward when I get home. He didn't answer. Brenda started to go red again. You know, a naked reward. Rudy Campbell. He said immediately. Or do you want my middle name, too? Couldn't hurt. That, too. It's Nathan. With that, the line went dead. A dial tone sounded through the receiver. No. Brenda whined. She realized she had spent too much time talking about nothing. 
She should have gone for the details right from the start. But then she remembered she had three more quarters. I'm calling again, she announced. No, 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 Afton said, giving her a gentle shove. It's my turn now. I want to talk to Rudy Campbell. Brenda made a realization. Oh my god, my name is Brenda Campbell, and I have a kid! Congratulations. Afton pushed again. You can call him back in a minute. It's my turn. Brenda slid out of the booth, and Afton reached for the phone. Then she remembered that she had no quarters. She stuck her head out to ask Brenda for one. What are you guys doing? Afton jumped. She physically jumped, as if someone had snuck up behind her and grabbed her butt, which had happened in that very mall. Her brother was standing there, looking suspicious, and also somewhat smug, as if he'd caught her in something. Waiting for you. Afton told him, quick on her feet. Uh, no. We were out of quarters about 20 minutes ago. Mark was next to him, and Stephen grabbed his watch, though he barely looked at it. And it's way past five. Afton didn't care. This was too important. Steve-o. She began, then wasn't sure where to go with it. Should she tell him the truth? Would he believe her? Would he make fun of her? Could he somehow use the information to belittle her or get her in trouble? Which had happened in that very mall. Turns out, Brenda did it for her. This phone booth is amazing, she said. It's totally, absolutely, 100% magic. Both boys looked at her like a priest would eye a flasher. Mark actually said, Huh? It's like able to make calls anywhere, anytime, to anybody, no matter how impossible. What are you talking about? Stephen asked, not bothering to hide how sick he was of stupid, constantly overdramatic girls. Afton answered the question. It's a telephone that works over time and space, letting you talk to any conceivable person. I don't know how it works. Brenda held out a quarter to Mark. Who would you call if you could talk to anybody on the phone? Mark didn't pause to think about it. He focused on an area approximately around her rib cage and said, You. I already tried that, Afton said. Brenda scowled at Mark, not allowing herself to get embarrassed. Get bent, creep. She handed the quarter to Stephen. Get in there and call whoever you want, no matter how crazy. No matter how crazy, he repeated as he slid into the booth. He put the quarter in and read the instructions glanced around at the girls, and said into the telephone, Superman. Outside the game, if it could be properly called that, Afton gave her brother's friend a disgusted look. Who did he say he was calling? Mark started to answer when Stephen's excited voice drew his attention. Holy crap! He said from where he sat. Mark stuck his head into the booth. What's going on? Stephen shook his head, waving Mark back. So, what's Metropolis like? He paused as he listened to the answer. And the Fortress of Solitude? Another pause. And what's Lex Luthor like? Is he really bald? Mark was getting impatient. Superman? Really? And how's your girlfriend, Lois Lane? She been in any danger lately? Mark was freaking out. I want to listen. Stephen simply held the phone out. Mark stuck his ear to it. A little bit accident prone, a man was saying. It was a strong, confident, heroic voice. But she's a journalist, and part of her charm is that she'll do just about anything for a story. Of course, she's excellent at what she does, which you've probably read. Mark gave the phone back to Stephen, who immediately said, Uh-huh. And, uh, how goes your life as Clark Kent? Well, whatever the man on the other end said, it suddenly put Stephen on the defensive. N nothing I, I was just asking. This was strange. No, I, I didn't, Stephen said. I just thought everybody knew you were Clark Kent. Mark wanted very much to hear the other end of the conversation. It's Stephen, Stephen McCarthy. But I didn't mean anything by it, Superman. In saying the name, Stephen's voice seemed to crack, as if puberty just took a giant leap forward. I'm sorry. What is he telling you? Mark asked, glancing over at Afton. She was beaming as if the phone were her invention. No, Stephen told the phone. You, you can trust me, sir. Mark turned back to the girls. Brenda was looking impatient. Hadn't she been the one who said she would stay till the mall closed if she could? Hey, Superman? Stephen said inside, his voice now sounding more childlike than usual. I just wanted to tell you that I think you're great. If you were real, I'd... Stephen cupped the phone and his mouth, telling a secret. But Mark still heard him say... I'd want to be just like you. A moment later, Stephen hung up. 
He climbed out of the booth and looked at Brenda and Afton. That really was Superman. How could you talk to Superman? Brenda asked. He doesn't exist. Afton also found it remarkable. Well, he just chewed me out. Whoever it was did a really good Superman impression. Brenda turned to Afton, not an ounce of irony on her face. He's not real, right? Afton didn't feel the question merited an answer. Sure sounded real. Stephen pointed at Mark. Hey, you've got to try this. No. Afton told them. It's my turn. Who are you going to call? Brenda asked. Ghostbusters! <laughs> shouted Mark, laughing. No one else laughed. Besides, I haven't got a turn. Call Spider-Man, suggested Stephen. Afton bodily shoved her brother out of the way and stepped into the booth. He complained loudly as if seriously oh, injured, but she didn't budge. Brenda leaned in next to her. Hey, Aft, if you can call fiction people, we can call people on shows we like, like soap operas. Can you give me a minute? Afton asked, her hand over the receiver. This is kind of important. Brenda clammed up and backed off. Not hurt exactly, but somewhat surprised. She could feel Mark's eyes on her backside and gave him the finger as she turned around. What? Inside the booth, Afton pulled shut the little curtain and said, Sabrina McCarthy, please. As the phone began to ring, Afton steeled herself for disappointment, for an operator telling her the call could not be completed as dialed, or for the machine to simply hang up and eat her quarter. But there was a click as the connection was made and someone answered their phone. Hello? A scratchy Utah accent said on the other end. Sabrina? Afton whispered. She had hoped it would work, but she hadn't really believed. Hey, Afton's a fun, her dead sister said. Afton could tell she was smiling. Thanks for calling. Sabrina? Afton said again. I, I don't know what to say. The last time she had seen her sister, alive that was, they had quarreled. Not seriously, but like sisters do. I want to use the bathroom. You're such a brat. Get off the phone. Give me back my bracelet. Why do you always get to have your way? Things that passed. Get off the phone. <laughs> but three years before, it hadn't had the chance to pass. Sabrina had died right before Christmas, lonely and apparently depressed about the holidays. It was December 20th when Sabrina, crying and angry, had driven off in her little diesel Jetta and had died sometime that night. She was found early the next morning by a Miller's Fork policeman on his way to work. He had noticed the car sitting on the side of the highway with its windows down and had stopped to investigate. The 17-year-old's body was leaning over the passenger seat, partially frozen. Turns out the cold hadn't killed her, but the half-bottle of sleeping pills she had swallowed at some point the previous evening. Such a public location. Dozens, if not hundreds, of cars had gone by, but not one of them had stopped to check it out. It's nice to hear your voice, Afton muttered, struggling for the perfect words. She didn't have long to talk, and there was so much she wanted to say. It's magic, her sister remarked. She sounded content, as she hadn't been in the last few months of her life. Then Afton knew what she wanted to say. Oh, Sabrina, I'm so sorry for... The words came out with a struggle and tears that were almost physically painful. For being mean to you. I wish... I wish... Afton, Sabrina said, calming and insistent. You don't have anything to be sorry for. We were sisters, and you were a good one. I'm the one who should apologize for leaving you, for hurting you and Mom and Dad. I didn't mean to. I sure regret it now. Afton sniffled. I changed my mind there at the end and tried to throw up the pills. But by then I was so numb, so sluggish. I just closed my eyes for a second to get some strength, and that was it. Oh, Afton said. Her father had been sure it was a mistake. His baby would never do something like that. Surely there was someone else involved. One of those worthless kids in black clothes and lipstick that she roamed around with. When Mrs. McCarthy had suggested that the man didn't really know his own daughter, well, he hadn't handled that well. Sabrina, as if sensing time passing, spoke up. I've been watching you, kiddo, and I'm impressed. No. Really, I am. You're becoming a lovely young woman. Changing, sure, but keeping the innocence you always had. Tears streamed down Afton's face, and she merely nodded, not thinking that her sister couldn't see her through the phone. 
Outside, Brenda, Stephen, and Mark were all standing around impatient and awkward. Something was certainly happening in that booth, and the fact that Afton was crying made it all the more uncomfortable. Sabrina's scratchy voice continued inside. Aft, you've got to fight to find the positive in life. Don't focus on the negative like I did. Keep up your piano playing. It'll take you far. Oh, and, and why don't you give Shane a call? Afton wiped one of her cheeks. He doesn't want to talk to me. Not on the day you went over to his house. He'd spent the whole day before playing soccer with his cousins, and his legs hurt so much he could barely stand. He was embarrassed, not mad. Afton had to know something. But why didn't they get to you in time? If you didn't want to die... Oh, Aft, there's only one person who can answer that question. Who? You know who. Sabrina said. I wish I had been a better sister to you. Afton found fresh, hot tears running like a constant stream down her face. You were a great sister. So were you. Afton, you're out of time. Afton looked. Sure enough, there were 14 seconds left. Take care of Stephen, her dead sister said. He needs somebody to help him be less of a dork, not point out how dorky he already is. A surprise. I will. Afton promised. Love you, kiddo. Love you, too. Hey, Sabrina? Yes? Where are you right now? I thought you already knew that. Don't worry. The connection was broken. The screen went back to insert coin. Afton sat in the booth for a minute, holding the phone. Outside, Stephen glanced at Mark's watch again. We're going to get in trouble. Mark shrugged. He didn't really care. And Stephen's mother was much more permissive than his own mom. So blame it on your sister. She'll never believe me. He imagined explaining that Afton had held them up in the video arcade, crying no less. He couldn't believe it himself. They saw Afton finally hang up the phone and started toward her. Brenda stopped them. Give us a sack, she said. Brenda stepped over to the booth and tapped on the plastic. You okay? Afton said nothing for a few seconds, then drew the curtain and looked up at her best friend. Your face is, um... Brenda began, then fished in her purse for her makeup compact. That bad? Afton whispered. Brenda handed her the mirror. Luckily, it was dark in there. Since the restrooms were right next to the arcade, they decided to make a break for it. Where are you going? Stephen asked, at the same time as Mark asked, What happened? Meet us outside the bathrooms. Brenda said, leading Afton toward the exit. Are we leaving then? Mark asked, as Stephen asked, Can I have a quarter? But both were ignored. Eventually, Afton emerged, her face freshly scrubbed and repainted by Brenda. Why she had bothered to put on makeup to go home, Stephen couldn't understand. As they headed to the car, she was mum on what happened or why she was broken up by it. She only said it was personal, and that she'd take full responsibility if their mother was angry at the lateness of the hour. Turns out their mother had fallen asleep on the couch with an old movie playing on WGN, and actually apologized to them when she woke up and realized she hadn't cooked any dinner. Afton said no problem, and let Stephen order a couple of pizzas. Before Brenda headed home, she asked Afton what it was like, whether it made things better or worse to talk to Sabrina. You promise not to tell anyone, Afton said. I know, I know, but I'm still curious. I, I guess it was a little of both. I mean, it hurt to hear her voice, knowing she's gone, but, well, I got to say goodbye to her, and... Afton trailed off, forcing herself to stay unemotional. It had been one of the most profound events in her life, something she'd never forget. She felt an indescribable connection to the spiritual world. I got... I don't know, some kind of closure, like they say on television. Brenda nodded, though she didn't really understand. To be honest, she was already blocking things off in her mind, trying to explain away what had happened. Unreality, it seems, did not suit her. A month later, she would no longer believe she had spoken to her future husband or that Afton had spoken to her dead sister. Six months down the line, she wouldn't even remember it. After Brenda went home, Afton went in her room and closed the door. 
She unearthed her journal, ashamed to see it had been almost three months since she had written anything in it, and began to jot things down. She knew it had really happened, knew it was real. Her sister sounded like she was all right. It seemed that Sabrina, who had been so unhappy and inconsolable for so long, had finally found a little peace. And to think she could talk to her sister any time she wanted, just by going to the mall. Another reason to love it. As Afton wrote about their exchange, she found she still had questions. Sabrina had said, you know who to ask that question to during their exchange. But who was she supposed to ask? If Sabrina herself didn't know the whys of the situation... The University Mall was closed on Sunday, so she'd have to wait until Monday. And Monday was the longest school day of her life. Her classes inched past. She found it difficult to concentrate. At lunch, she found she had no appetite. When school let out, she chose to walk home, run actually, instead of wait for the bus to take her the nine blocks to her house. When she got in and found her mother in the living room working on a quilt, she was out of breath. Is everything okay? Afton nodded, immediately asking if she could borrow the car for an hour. What for? Afton didn't know what to say. She was afraid of saying the wrong thing and being caught in a lie. Unlike Brenda, she saw honesty in purely black and white terms. But she was more afraid of how her mother would react if she heard the truth. It's really important. Mrs. McCarthy started to ask what it was. But something in her daughter's eyes convinced her that not only was it actually important, but of a potentially embarrassing nature. All right, but please be fast. I have to return Sister Fan her casserole dish before dark. Afton said that she would, then rushed out to the car. She belted up and drove to the mall to make her phone call to God. She was so excited when she pulled into the parking lot that she left the car in drive, then couldn't understand why she couldn't pull the key out of the ignition. The arcade was less busy on a Monday afternoon than on a Saturday. Most of its patrons were her age or older. A bunch of guys from UVCC were playing gauntlet together, making a lot of noise. As she made her way to the back of the room, she should have expected what she found there. Of the four seemingly broken games that had been there the day before, only the blinking joust game remained. She went to the pimply-faced guy behind the counter. He smiled at her. Then he must have seen something in her eyes because he asked, Is anything wrong? When she asked about the magic phone booth, he didn't know what she was talking about. Barely older than she was, he seemed qualified only to make change and report on high scores. But he did volunteer to call his manager in the back room. A moment later, another young man, this one obviously freshly home from his mission, stepped out, giving the pimply teen a nod. Did one of the machines eat your money? He asked keys jingling in his hand. She explained a second time. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. Uh, we had it for a week and a half, and nobody ever played it. I played it. Well, the manager said. I, I didn't mean literally nobody. She asked him what had happened to it. The owner shipped a couple out this morning. Now, that must have been one of them. She asked how she could track it down, stressing again that it was important. The guy kept jangling his keys as he told her she'd have to talk to the owner coming in the next morning. She asked his name. Well, the owner? It's Sergeant. Uh, he leaves when I get here at two, so you can catch him sometime before that. Afton wasn't about to sit through school a second agonizing day in a row. Tuesday morning, she snuck out after roll call in her gym class, not bothering to change out of her PE clothes. She had only skipped school one time before. Brenda's idea, and it hadn't gone well, but she didn't care. She made it to the bus stop no more than three minutes before the northbound bus came along. She had no change, but the bus driver accepted a dollar. The metal gate was down in front of the arcade, and it was dark inside. Afton paced around, worrying about getting caught, worrying about missing something important in her classes, worrying about the owner not showing up, and wondering why she didn't change into her school clothes. Just as she was about to go and check the bus schedule, an overweight man entered the mall and stopped in front of the gate. He fumbled for his keys there, and Afton stepped up to him. Mr. Sergeant? He turned. He was balding and paunchy, with a bulging stomach and thick glasses. Yes? 
I was here yesterday. I talked to the manager about tracking down a game called Magic Phone Booth. The owner smiled, snorting a bit. Oh, that. He unlocked the gate. I sent that back. Oh, where? Distributor. They brought it here by mistake. I just got around to shipping it back. It was a gag anyway. Afton told him it wasn't a gag. I were broken then. My maintenance man said he tried it and it didn't work. We weren't supposed to have it to begin with. He lifted up the metal gate, eager to start his day. Who did he call? Sergeant frowned, wanting to be somewhere else. But the girl had a sincere, vulnerable face, and it was hard to turn her away. He said... He shook his head. It was so dumb. (laughs) Said he tried to call Hitler with it. Somebody actually answered and pretended they were him. Adolf Hitler? Uh, I don't know. He said the guy only spoke German. Of course he would have spoken German. Afton looked at the floor. Please, sir. The owner stepped through the entryway of a store, about to pull the gate down behind him. If it really worked, then why weren't there lines of people wanting to use it? He asked. Afton didn't know. There were possibilities, but none were coming to mind. I really need to find that game, Mr. Sergeant. The fact that she knew his name gave him pause. To play it? She nodded. Please? Sergeant crossed back out again. He put a pudgy hand on her shoulder and squeezed gently, awkwardly reassuring. Aren't you a little old to believe in that sort of thing? She shook her head. It's a trick, like a fortune teller, or astronomy, horoscopes, that sort of thing. No. Tears came quickly to her eyes. She couldn't stop them. I used it. It was real. The man ran his hand over where his hair used to be. Listen, I wish there was magic phones, too. Don't you think I'd love to call the coach at the Jazz and give him a piece of my mind any time I want? She was not reassured. You don't understand. I spoke to my sister. She... She's been dead for years. Her tears came spilling down her cheeks, making dark spots on her gym shirt. Oh, sweetie. Sergeant looked ashamed, as if it were his fault she was crying. Look, I'll give you the number of my distributor. He'll have the invoice number of the game and can probably track it down for you. Okay? She managed to smile. Come on. Afton sniffled and followed him inside. You need a tissue? No, thank you. He started to go behind the counter, but was distracted by two teenagers entering the arcade. Hey, we're closed. Huh? One spoke, a perfect word for his whole personality. We open at two. Sergeant said, immediately stern. He pointed from one boy to the other. You should be in school. The teen slinked off like a couple of Gila monsters. One called the owner a feminine hygiene product as they slipped out under the gate. The man glowered after them. Stupid kids, they'll be breaking into the change maker a year from now. He turned back to Afton, embarrassed by this. (sighs) Sorry, honey. Sweat had gathered at his temples, and the girl felt sorry for him. That's okay, she said. I should be in school, too. Mr. Sergeant went into the back room. The arcade was oddly silent around Afton, with the games dead and dark. One or two still beeped and played their tinny music, but mostly, it was unusually quiet in there. It felt like a lonely place. When he came out, he handed her a piece of notepaper. The name and number had been written in pencil, in a lovely artistic print. Thank you so much. He lifted up his glasses, revealing honest, kind eyes. What's your name? Afton. Afton? I'm not saying I believe in magic telephones, but if they do exist, there are some things that, well, it's better not to know. If I could talk to my old dad again, I'd do it all the time. He had all the answers all the time, and when he died when I was 14, I was never the same. He met her eyes, trying to see if she understood. Without him around, I had to grow up awful fast. A lot of the choices I made when I was your age, I made because I thought he might be watching me. And I didn't want to let him down. If I could have just called him up, well, I might have made more mistakes and respected him less. Afton found herself nodding. I wish I could have stayed in touch with my dad, but if I had... I wouldn't have learned the same lessons I did on my own. Think about it before you call. Okay. She said, though she had no intention of doing so. Look, let me get you something. 
Will you wait? She waited. When he came out, he had a green dollar-shaped piece of paper. It was a gift certificate. This will get you ten free games here, anytime. Come back when we're open and have some fun. Thank you. She said. Nah, be nice to have more girls in here anyway. She told him how much she appreciated it and made her way out of the arcade. She considered going to a payphone right then, but had to be back in time for Algebra 2. Blowing off one class was bad enough. She told herself she would call when school was over, but she didn't. She told herself she would call the next day, but she didn't. Time passed, and she gave Stephen the gift certificate. Grateful, he treated her like a normal human being for almost an entire day until he forgot. But she never called the distributor's number. She even tore the paper in half once, but didn't throw it away. It ended up slipping into the cracks of obscurity as most school papers or childhood keepsakes do. She told herself she'd call one day when she really felt she had to. Even though, by that point, she didn't know if the distributor could even find the game again. But that day never came. Maybe once was enough. Maybe she liked the possibility of magic more than the reality of it. Maybe she was afraid of what would happen if she actually got God on the phone. Or just her sister again. Or John Lennon. Or her firstborn son. Or whoever. Maybe there were too many doors that could be opened that way. Too many easy answers to questions she needed to think about long and hard on her own. Maybe life was complicated enough without throwing the supernatural into the mix. Maybe she didn't know. Yeah, that was probably it. Author's Note. Hey guys. Thanks for giving another one of my stories a listen. A, a good actor can elevate the material she or, or he is given uh, and bring it, bring it to life in a different way than the author intended. I, I don't have a lot to say about this particular story, but, but I will mention two things. Although I didn't explicitly state it, this, um, this story is supposed to take place during my youth, in the late 80s, when every mall had a busy, dimly lit video arcade, and no kids had cell phones or um, those teleport ankle bands that are coming soon. It was a, a, a simpler time, uh, and it's what I know, so there's that. I chose to use Tom Cruise as the teen idol because he was so huge in those days, and but, but he's still popular enough today to have relevance if kids read the story now. Uh, part of the fun of, of, of writing this piece was coming up with people you could call if a magic phone booth actually existed. I, I made a list of a bunch of possibilities and got so carried away that, well, I'm worried that the story got really long. You know, I, I hope not, but... But there is a shorter version out there that you guys chose not to go with, so, so you probably know what you're doing. I, if, it, if it does go on and on, I'm sorry. But I hope that somebody out there got a kick out of it and may, maybe even got the nostalgic feeling I intended by trying to remember that time in my life and, and, and projecting it on Afton and, and her friends. I, 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 tend to write a, uh, I tend to write about teenagers a lot because that is a confusing, exciting, and, 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 and magical time of life. You know, trying new things, going out into the world without a clue as to how things work or, or what might be behind the next corner. Uh, of course, I'm mostly talking about myself here. Uh, and, and maybe you, if I'm lucky. Thanks. All right, welcome back, everybody. 
Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, we got Soundwave here in the studio. We're starting to sound like a real show here. We, we reintroduce our guests after a little while. How about that? Soundwave from the Transformers and Beast War saga. Well, he- I tend to distance myself from Beast Wars. Uh, were, were you even involved in that? Did you transform into like a, what would be the equivalent of a tape recorder? In in the 90s. <laughs> there was talk of me appearing in Beast Wars. I would transform into a dat recorder, but huh. it didn't work out. Ah, uh, dat recorder. That might have been interesting. No, I don't. So uh, the story, Soundwave, what did you think of the story? <laughs> was there a transformer that turned into a telephone by any chance? Not to my knowledge. Is there any Transformers that you don't know about? There was Operator. (laughs) He turned into a phone booth. Did you sell a lot of toys of Operator? Unfortunately, no. We sold far more toys of Vibrator, but (laughs) those were removed from shelves rather quickly. Oh, yeah. Moms shopping with their children might have found a little something interesting for once in the toy section. Outside of the Barbie aisle, the doll aisle, I don't know. There are some moms that dig on crap like that, aren't there? It seems Vibrators? like I would hope so. <laughs> toy collecting is pretty dominantly a male thing. There's not a lot of women that are like, hey, look it, I got... There, there was the Beanie Baby craze that oh, I yeah. think was primarily women. What Probably wasn't even kids. It was like middle-aged women. <laughs> and then, yeah, Barbies. Doll collecting in general, I think, still goes on. With I had a girlfriend in high school whose mom was a big-time doll collector. But she would only get ones that were going to be, like, valuable, you know. It wasn't like, oh, I think this one's cute or something. It was like, this one will be worth something. So she bought the Holiday Barbies because Holiday Barbies were expected to go up in value. And she wouldn't even take them out of the box. It was one of those kind of things, you know. I've never liked that, you know. I actually, I have to hold up my hand and admit that I am a nerdy toy collector. I do have a few toys that I've uh, saved for the mythical day when one day I have my own study and I have a bookshelves lined with my novels and stuff like that someday. I... But yeah, I've never understood the keep it in the box thing. Why would you want to keep it in a box? I don't know. It's, well, it's got to go back to the Star Wars craze because when those toys suddenly became valuable in the 90s, if you had one that was unopened, you know, it was worth 10 times. Uh the regular version was or or maybe way more than 10 times and now i think the perception is that any toy and and that's probably true too probably with your toys sound wave the transformers if you still have it in a box it's worth unbelievable amounts i i think that's what it is it's just these people that are like i get more joy from imagining being able to sell it for 10 times its value in the future than opening it and playing with it Hmm. but it's not something that i feel i had those star wars toys and tore them up and buried them in the sandbox and threw them <laughs> and all sorts of fun stuff. And I never regretted any of that. It's uh-huh. just the fun that I had as a little boy with them far outweighs any dollar amount that you could have fixed to right. them now. Yeah, I did, I did that with my G.I. Joe toys. And I was much older by the time G.I. Joe was uh, what I was into. And so I still had them in fairly decent shape by the time that I was, okay, I'm not going to play with toys anymore. And I had them in a box in my closet. But I had a little brother that was seven years younger than me. And he was just like, oh, there's these great toys and they're in a box, the top of the freaking closet. And so all the time I would come home and my closet doors were open and there's like a chair or something propped up next to it. And my brother has gone up there and gotten them down. And at a certain point, I finally said, you know what? So it was like I suddenly became Woody from Toy Story where I was trying to explain to Buzz Lightyear or something. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You, you know, you're better as a toy than you are as a space ranger because you've got a, a child that loves you and thinks the world of you or whatever. And so I finally thought, what am I going to do with these toys in the box? And so I got the toys out of the box and I gave them all to my little brother to play with all the time. He did the same thing. He buried him in the yard and threw him over the fence and all that kind of stuff. So all my G.I. Joes are, are long gone. I kind of miss them, but, you know, they made my little brother happy, I hope. So there's that. So you don't think that at some point you would have gotten them down, say, in high school and played with them? Uh, I was having sex in high school. I don't know how we got on to this topic. I do. Yeah, I'm not sure where that topic came from either, I guess. Uh, but we were going to talk about the story, I think. Okay, well, what, what was it that you liked about this story? Why did you choose to do it? You know, when I first read this story, I just, I don't know. It's the idea of you got a phone that can call anybody. 
what are you going to do with that? And it, I just thought it was really fun, all of the different things that these kids did as they came up with one idea after the other of who they could call. It was just really entertaining where they would go next with it. And some of them were really fun. You know, the girl who calls her husband-to-be before she's calling the future and talking to her husband after they're married and, you know, and <laughs> the kid who calls Superman. All that kind of stuff. And I also liked the <laughs> the bit with the... The French kid, you know, the, the cutest boy in the world or whatever. I don't know if uh, anybody in our audience understood what it was that the uh, French boy was saying. I only have a very, very... I don't speak a word of French. So yeah, I, I have a very basic knowledge of French because I took French in high school where you don't learn anything. Okay, if, if you had a magic phone booth, if there was a magic phone booth right here and you could go in and call anyone, who, who would you call? If Operator suddenly walked in the door and transformed and I could just dial up whatever I wanted. I think we have a much better version right now of the story with it being an enemy robot in disguise. I don't know. I If I could call anyone in existence, even, you could even call fictional characters. Yeah, what happens if you pick somebody from a thousand years ago or whatever where there were no telephones (laughs) well it didn't seem to matter i mean she called her friend while she was across the room getting changed so apparently something would happen i don't know maybe they'd pick up a seashell and they'd be like what i hear a voice in this thing and they'd start i don't know how that works out but uh, when i was a, a teenager my mom passed away and it's been 20 years now since that happened and we weren't one of those families that had the video tape recorder the uh, minute that became possible to get i do have some film that she's on but you don't hear somebody on uh, the old eight millimeter films and stuff like that you can see them but yeah we have like one videotape in which my mom appears and i can get some kind of memory refresher or, or whatever as to what she was like and and the whole time you know and my brother's got the cameras pointing at her and she's like turn that thing off get it out of here don't point it at me kind of a thing so she was always that way you know she didn't want to be in pictures she didn't want to be in anything a lot of people are like that where they just don't appreciate being put in that position i guess and she was definitely one of those so yeah there's nothing to fall back on to to you know to help uh, remember what my mom was like so maybe that would be a good person to call i don't know if she called right now but didn't say who she was would you recognize her by her voice i doubt it the videotape that i'm talking about that we had it was taken by my brother-in-law at christmas when i was like eight or ten or something like that and uh yeah the weird thing is you know i didn't see that video for 10 or 15 years and then i was at my brother-in-law's house and looking through some of his old videotapes and i found it and i said hey can i make a copy of it and stuff and so i did and then when i watched i was like wow some reason her voice sounds different than what i remember it sounding like so this is just a couple years after she was gone it was probably 10 years after she had died so halfway between there and now by then i was yeah you know and i was a teenager when she died too and you know what people are like when they're teenagers they're just completely wrapped up in themselves you know they're the only thing that's important the only thing that matters in the world and so i was not in the right mindset even for the fact that my mom was dying and maybe I ought to do something with her a little more often or pay attention to her or something. This is just unfortunate because, yeah, I have to look back on that with some regrets and wish that maybe I'd done something differently. But I was a kid. I mean, I don't hold it against myself if you can do such a thing. But, uh, you know, I I wish that I'd had an idea of you know, the importance of everything back then. You were starting to say, I'm sure. Yeah, no, you're fine. If you don't blame yourself, then I, there's nothing I can say. I was going to say, I'm sure that she would tell you, you know, not to worry about that kind of thing. That I mean, we just, we've all been teenagers and we yeah. know how important such unimportant things are <laughs> to a teenager. And, and the one weekend that I get grounded or whatever, it's like the end of the world that I don't get to go out with my friends who I don't even maintain contact with now right yeah it's always so upsetting when you hear about some teenager who has taken their own life because of whatever thing that is going on and you just think oh it's it's such a shame because if they'd only waited two years they would have realized just how 
insignificant the whole thing is. Maybe it'd take longer. I don't know. There's some people, it seems, that never made it out of their teenage years. But for most people, <laughs> you get over stupid things like judging somebody as to how expensive their jeans are or something that they're wearing or as to how cool their haircut is or whatever. Yeah, that's one of those things that's just ludicrous to me now, that anybody would care if you had a members-only jacket or an OP <laughs> shirt. or Holy crap, members-only jackets were the best! You know, whether you had parachute pants on or, or just regular pants or, or, or whatever it might be, you know. <laughs> what symbol is on your friggin' tennis shoes uh -huh. you know, or trainers for unascertained? That's a strange name. Yeah, they do things differently over across the pond. Anyways, I guess that's who I'd call. I'm not sure if I had more time to think about it. No, that makes total sense. Um, I might come up Do with that? a few more. And that's that's how the girl was. But yeah, I would definitely lean that way. Just like, and, and maybe the girl gave me the idea. I don't know. But I think I probably would pick that anyways. But who would you call if you had the opportunity to call anybody in the history of the world? No, I think when we were doing the Twilight Zone episode recently, I talked about my favorite episode. And oh, so you would, you would call that chick that was the cat lady? And perchance to dream. No, I already met her. Oh. I, oh, sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go on. Go on. I called the young Elizabeth Taylor. Oh. It's like, describe yourself in front of a mirror. No, I I would I would call myself as a boy uh -huh. and try and give myself encouragement and advice. Ah. Tell myself to avoid some of the mistakes that I m would make later in life. And, and the, the and, thing and is... And then you as a boy would say, F off. Why don't you go eat a bag of... <laughs> I don't give a crap what you say. What are you, some old piece of <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Have you seen this in another story? <laughs> now, that's something I've been completely fixated on for 20 years, for more than 20 years. It's uh -huh. just the idea of an older version, an experienced version of myself being able to advise and mentor a younger version of myself. Uh -huh. Because I'm one of those people that just dwells on mistakes <laughs> that I've made over and over. In fact, geez. Is it okay if I do this right now? Uh, maybe. I've got to apologize. Um, and it, it's been weeks ago by the time this episode airs. But I said something on an episode that I, I need to address. Um, there was an episode we did a while ago. And I said that the director of the new Spider-Man movie was named James Webb, but it's actually Mark Webb. I, I just kind of had to get that off of my chest. You've been dwelling on that for a while too, haven't you? At least it was Webb. <laughs> but aside from that, I'm one of those people that goes over and over and over conversations that I had or arguments or fights or, or mistakes that I made or accidents or whatever it is. And I would love to be able to advise the younger, naiver version of me. I mean, even the one that, that's speaking right now, I would love a future version of me to uh -huh. fix me and my world. <laughs> and in the story, you only had three minutes. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Something like that. So I don't know what I'd say to it, like a 12 year old version of me or a 10 year old in three in minutes, three minutes yeah. but i would try and then, you know the same with you and your mom you know you try and jam as much as you can into that little conversation and hope that it sticks i, I think in this particular story there's no repercussions though you know it's not like as soon as you hang up the time frame would change <laughs> and uh -huh. the advice you gave to yourself would have taken effect or anything uh, like yeah, that i don't know i don't i don't know that that was actually because in the story, I don't think they ever called anybody in the past. They called future husband. They called already dead sister. Yeah, but Brenda has no knowledge of this conversation that she but, had on the oh, phone. There's because that. it's sort of just a magic thing. There's that. That's true. Yeah, so maybe you couldn't call yourself and advise yourself in the past. Maybe you could only talk to somebody and hang out. Would you like to call and hang out with your 12-year-old uh, self? Or would that be excruciating pain? It might be really embarrassing. I've I've gone through that scenario a few times, wondering if I would just beat the crap out of the younger version of myself. Because <laughs> I know myself, and I know I've got no greater enemy in the world than me. And I, I can just imagine shaking myself and trying to get me to listen, knowing what I'm probably thinking right now, you know, and, and knowing that it, I'm not going to apply any of the advice that I'm giving you know, I've wondered that before in my past, too. I wonder if that would make a good story idea. Maybe I should write something like that. But I had this idea way back when of what it would be like if I had, like, an exact copy of myself. To have sex with? No. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 what were you saying? I, I was, I was kinda, miles away. That kind of creeps me out. 
No, I was just, just as a friend, if there was an exact copy of myself, would I want to hang out with that person? <laughs> would that be a really good friend because he is me? Or would I just be like, holy crap, I cannot effing stand this guy. I wish he would go away. And then what would that do to you? Because you know that that's you anyways. Would you totally hate yourself? I don't know. That might make an uh, interesting idea for a story sometime. I don't know if I ever wrote anything. The closest you're ever going to get to that is an identical twin. Uh-huh. And, you know, I, I think on the air I talked about this girl that had an identical twin. And she was so intrinsically tied to this person that, like, you know, she would call her several times a day at work. And I'd just be like, whoa, who are you talking to now? It's like, oh, my sister again. She's like, what? You just, and, and she went into some kind of withdrawal if they weren't together. Uh-huh. Everything that she did each day, she she was incomplete until she told her sister about it yeah. and found out what her sister had done on her day. And now, maybe that was a strange... Uh, I, I don't think so. ...an aberration, but... There was this David Cronenberg movie called uh, Dead Ringers where Jeremy Irons played identical twins. And one of them said to the other... You haven't experienced something until you've told me about it. And it was just, yeah, this weird, parasitic, incestuous relationship <laughs> between the two brothers. And I just thought, holy crap, that's what twins are like? Ew. But that's totally how this girl was with her identical huh. twin. And you know, it, I've, I've seen that with a lot of different twins where a lot of them, I mean, twins have a tendency to be really, really, really good friends for some reason. But there's also, I think, a tendency. Because they some, shared the same sack. Sorry. There's also a tendency sometimes for twins to rebel against that whole thing as well. Because sometimes there's that perception. People can't tell them apart. They'll mix their names up and stuff like that. And sometimes they will purposely do something totally different from what their twin does. Just so that they can be that one. No, I'm not the one that does this. I'm. They want their own identity right, that, apart from their twin. Sometimes there's that, too, that I think twins have to deal with. I don't know. My, I have nephews that are twins. And then on my wife's side, I have nieces who are twins. And the nieces are much younger, so they haven't gotten to any, you know, identity crisis on multiple Earths type thing yet. But my nephews are much older. And there was a time when they were younger that I had a hard time telling them apart. Not so much anymore because one of them has adopted a more severe haircut, whereas the other has got a more crazy haircut. So that kind of helps. But I think I'd still, I think I still would have problems. So it's uh, as much to do with the fact that I live in a different state than they do, um, as it is for whether they have their own identity. Well, I, I was sort of interested in this girl that had the twin. Uh huh. And just because just, you were hoping for a threesome, wasn't it? I think everybody's brain goes there. <laughs> But but I, what I would realize when I would talk to her and hear her talk about her sister as though she was herself was how close to this girl could you actually get? You could never be as intimate with this girl as her sister is to her. They Probably share true. the same friggin' egg. Same double helix. Yeah, they had lived 90% of their lives together or something like that. And it certainly, they, you know, they couldn't stand to be apart for more than a couple of hours. And I think you would always just be a seat filler for her sister. <laughs> but that, that's my opinion. And, 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 and granted, this was just this one girl. And maybe other people revolt against that. They really push away from that and say, I'm going to be my own person. Yeah. And I'm going to only call him on our birthday and things like that. You've probably offended all our twin listeners. Yeah, and now. I didn't mean to. I'm just saying with this particular twin, and sadly, she was the only identical twin I ever knew. Uh -huh. So I don't know what others were like, but I was fascinated with it. I mean, I, I've never known that. And you ha apparently have two sets that you can talk to and stuff. But Yeah. But just the thought that somebody could come up to you and think they know you <laughs> because yeah. of the way you look. But it's your sibling that they actually know or what, you know what I mean? It's almost as though you have had some kind of out-of-body experience <laughs> and you've done things or sleepwalking or, or amnesia or, you know, things like that where people will be like, hey, how long has it been? And you're like, do I not remember this guy or is it my brother? That <laughs> right. Does? Yeah, you're always wondering if you're uh, in that uh, sci-fi story suddenly where uh, things have changed around. She says, thanks for last night. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Can you can you remind me in yeah. every specific detail? I liked last night, too. Let's do it again. 
I, yeah. we, we're not really touching upon this particular story. <laughs> But hey, uh, when do we me. ever, anyways? We always just use the story as a uh, takeoff point for a thousand tangents, so it's all good. I, oh, hey, Soundwave, if you could use the magic phone booth and call anybody, who would it be? I would call Megatron. Uh, that's what I would have guessed. What is the deal with you and Megatron, anyway, Soundwave? What, what do you mean? mean? Okay, like in the movie, Megatron is like dead, everybody's leaving him. And you go back and pick him up and carry him away lovingly in his arms. I could not leave him there. Yeah, so what's the deal with that? What are you insinuating? You know, what, what is the deal? Hey, I... hey, hey, let me interrupt. Soundwave is not gay. He's just extremely loyal. Thank, Thank you. you. Extremely loyal, is it? Yes. <laughs> I resent the implication. Now you're going to say John Travolta is gay, Tom Cruise is gay, Kevin Spacey is gay, Ryan Seacrest uh, okay, is Okay, okay. I guess I'll let it drop. But it, you have to admit it's awful suspicious. You have no idea of brotherhood and loyalty. You would never make it as a Decepticon. Well, the Decepticons were the bad guys. They don't like each other. Well, hey, well, you guys had Starscream. Yeah, seriously. Starscream was endlessly trying to take everything Megatron had. No, Starscream, he was gay. Oh. Uh, okay, well, what about Rumble? I mean, Rumble went back and carried Megatron's little gun right behind you. I mean, come on, that's... Oh, yes, Rumble, a giant queen. I didn't realize he was going to be such an offensive guest. Okay. Yeah, Soundwave, I think we're going to get in trouble for all this stuff. I, I, you're going to have to edit that stuff out, I think, and, and, and we're going to have to move on because... That's right. Let's, let's just talk about the story. Yeah, let's move back to the story. Sorry. He checked. Whoa, holy crap. That part was recorded on Laserbeak? <laughs> wow. Now, see, I could never tell Buzzsaw and Laserbeak apart. Laserbeak was the only one they ever used. We talk about di identical twins, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's that. But well, well, what, weren't they different colors? Uh, really, Laserbeak was red. What was Rumble's little twin? Like, I don't remember. <laughs> Frenzy was Rumblebeak's little twin. I don't remember. <laughs> I, I don't know that we've ever said it on the air. But that part in Transformers, the 86 movie, mm -hmm. where Rumble is carrying Megatron's gun is like the greatest friggin' thing. <laughs> that, I mean, I, I remember when the 2007 Transformers movie came out, I was like, dude, that moment where Rumble is carrying Megatron's gun is the greatest thing in this movie. And people would tell me, no, that wasn't in the 2007 Transformers. <laughs> that was in Transformers the movie. And I'd be like, oh, what? sorry. Greatest thing in the 2007 Transformers movie was the lines that they lifted directly from the 1986 movie. When, couple of lines of when he says, one shall stand and one <laughs> shall fall. That was the, pretty much the only good part, yeah. What did you think of the 2007 movie sound? Well, have you enjoyed that, uh, the, the new uh, updated look of the Transformers, right? Whores. <laughs> Whoa! All of you whores. Whoa! Soundwave! I didn't know you were such a foul-mouthed... Michael Bay can lick my robotic taint. Jeez! All right, no, no, I, I'm in agreement with him. I mean, I don't have well, a robotic taint. Maybe after a car accident or something, but uh, Michael Bay, he can. Yeah, he probably should. In 1998, I went to the premiere of Armageddon. Okay. I was in L.A. doing an internship, and we uh -huh. all got to go to that. And you were young and naive, and you had no idea. <laughs> I needed the money. <laughs> anyway, Michael Bay came to the, you know, obviously he came. But Michael Bay was there, and, uh, you know, people were blowing him and throwing him money and That's how prophylactics came, and hotel room rings and throwing him or whatever orifices were available. And, and uh, I had just seen Armageddon, and it was a terrible, terrible movie. And here was the director right there in front of me, and he was shaking people's hands. And I said to, to my friend that I was there with, I was like, oh, shoot, please don't have him ask what I thought of the movie. Please, please, please. And basically just shook my hand and said how you doing and i was like good good hope to see more movies from you this is the stupidest <laughs> crap but chris asked me what would you have said if he had asked you what you thought of the movie would you have lied uh, i probably would have told him i really liked the rock but yeah that was a really strange experience because boy that was a bad movie i don't know that it was as bad as transformers which would you say was worse you can't put that question to me because i've never watched armageddon there are times, Mr. Data. 
that I envy you. That was the biggest money-making movie of the year, wasn't it? It sure beat out Deep Impact. Yeah, I think it was the big movie of 98. Number one song for Aerosmith, at least. First one ever, I think, sadly. I like that song. Yeah, it's all right, but they've had a lot of good songs, and if none of them were number one... We used to have a podcast, you and I. Yeah? Tell we'd me about play it. stories on it, and uh -huh. among those stories was Hang Up and Try Again. Oh. But we had nothing to say about it. Hey, in the comments, please don't bash us, but feel free to tell us who you would call the magic phone booth. Can you believe I'm doing this? I'm resorting to this. <laughs> How do I live with myself? Don't know. Me from 2015 is going to call and say, please, please don't air the Hang Up and Try Again episode. Do you have to only have one call? These people didn't have one call. You could call several people, right? Yeah, it depends on which version of the story you read. <laughs> The author explained to me when we accepted the story that there was a short version that didn't include as many calls, didn't have as many, but my favorite part of the story was the various calls that they made to the various people, so I chose to go with the long version. Maybe y'all were bored to death and wanted to decapitate me for my mistake, but I'm in charge, so eat a bag of d and die. <laughs> I gotta stop saying that. <laughs> so this, we had a lot of female voice talent on this one. Uh huh. I, this, this was much talent. more female centric than most of our stories, even though you read it. You know, you know, we've really been uh, lucky to have so many people willing to do voices for us and and to do such a good job. And I think Julie did Brenda's voice, but on the uh, on the read through, I did Brenda, and I think it was my best <laughs> performance ever. <laughs> Your best performance ever. Huh? I think so, yeah. I think, you know, if, if I was ever going to get a Parsec Award. <laughs> Which you're not. Maybe we could save that and you could just send that off as auditions when you try to audition for like Captain Kirk or whatever on these other shows. If I was ever going to marry someone, it would be Rosie Cotton. All right. Well, didn't you read? Okay, we're going to have a lot of outtakes, aren't we? We ought to finish this episode off. Huh? Let's finish this episode off. What were we talking about? Does it not matter? Oh, okay. We have a group of voice actors that are very good at what they do, and they're very willing to help us out. So thank you all for helping to make this story. I mean, if it's successful, it's because of Liz and, and, and Julie, Julie and Abby. And, and, Abby and, and Yeah, so thanks for all your help, everybody, on that. Definitely our show wouldn't make it without the help that we get. In fact, so, I think we've got one coming up where the narrator is female, the main character. Oh, yes, we do. And so that'll be really cool, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's our show for today. Yep. Thanks for listening, those thank of you who stuck around. Oh, hey, hey, and hey, before you go, oh. Soundwave, thank you for helping us out today. Anything in the editing that made this show less offensive, we have you to thank. That's right. It, it was, was my pleasure. pleasure. Although most of the stuff he had to edit out was his own comments, but uh, all right. Good night, folks. Yes, <laughs> two Autobots. I'm sorry, what? What? What was that? Nothing. Well, thank yeah, thanks for being here, and uh, maybe we'll see you again next week, Soundwave. Hope so. I've got so many questions. All right. That's it. Good night. Oh, I've been Rich Outfield. And I continue to be Big Anklevich. And I'm Soundwave. Yep. And he's Soundwave. All right, Soundwave. And I'm Announcer Man. And Announcer Man. Thanks for finally chiming in, though. Oh, okay, we gotta go. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's been our show. Thanks. Good night. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steef. The Dune Steef is okay, released... Okay, announcer, man. Who would you call on the magic phone book? Magic, magic phone booth. I don't know. I'm just an announcer. Okay. Well, you've mm, got us there. All right. I guess there would maybe be a magic phone book as well. Yeah, so you could, get, so you like, could that... call those people, get their numbers. Well, yeah, why would Maybe you... the wizard was using the magic phone book, the guy with the in the picture. Uh huh? Did you just make a sexual intercourse <laughs> gesture? No, that's... That's him holding out the phone. Ah, that's and it has a phone in his hand. There. Has exclamation marks come out. I'm going to draw that picture, and that's going to be the art. I got to do that. There you go. Sorry, this is all we've got for you tonight. I wish it was better, too. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. It, it was all right in its day, I guess. It wasn't the best effort, but... So, see so yeah. Why are we still talking? I don't know. I thought we ended the show. Bye.
Take two. I think Julie did Brenda's voice, but on the uh, on the read through, I did Brenda, and I think it was my best <laughs> performance ever. It's a trick, right? Well, maybe it's an impressionator. Maybe there's a bunch of operators standing by who do a bunch of celebrity voices, and when you say the right one, a light comes on the screen in front of them, and then they pretend to be him. It was a blue blouse, a blue blouse. I tried it on in the fitting room and didn't take it off. I put my coat on over it. Do you like the voice? Oh, gosh. <laughs> what? It may be the most annoying woman in the world, so it's good that we'll probably have somebody else do it. She is brought back to the days when she was 16 and the mall turned especially magical. So can you do it a little bit like a fa or fairy tale in a way? Rather than just, Afton McCarthy loved to go to the mall, Captain. Afton McCarthy loved going to the mall. There was always something new there. Sale to look into. Something to buy. Very little girls. <laughs> the very smell of the mall made Afton smile. What the hell kind of a name is Afton anyways? Do you not like the name? <laughs> it's not a name. It's just some made up thing. It's no biggie, he told her. Though she'd never known a real person to use the word biggie. Except for Biggie Smalls. Oh, well, this is pre Biggie Smalls. <laughs> he was just a dirty bastard back then. <laughs> Afton, I sort of need to go. I've got some people over. Afton was tremendously disappointed. Girls? No, they're some friends from out of town, but I appreciate the nice things you told me. Yeah, Tom Cruise wouldn't have girls over. There's no worry about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. She chose to call Mr. Prunty. Grunties. Grunty. Suddenly, a blonde, ponytailed head stuck itself into the booth, Witter. 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 <laughs> Did he tell you anything interesting? <laughs> what? Oh, uh, you don't like voice. it. voice. Now it's got a uh, lisp going in there as well. Did he tell you anything interesting? Brenda grinned. Her eyes sparkled. Oh my god, Brett, often do it. Go do it often. <laughs> I wonder how specific. I'm guessing him for the least every decent. I wonder how specific. I wonder how specific. How I can't spit it all. I'm a teacher. It's working out great. Mon père parle peu anglais, anglais, damn it. Mon père parle... Damn, that's kind of hard to put all the peurs in together. <laughs> it's all peas, three in a row. Mon père parle peu anglais. Mon père parle peu anglais. Are we just going to have that one dude read it anyways? I think so. Mais il n'est pas à la maison. <laughs> Very impressive. That one was foamy and yucky. Just about threw up all over the microphone thing there. The poor guy. Uh, I just pity him when he's just like, did I do something wrong? <laughs> She's like asking him his name. And then he just immediately, Rudy Campbell. <laughs> or do you want my middle name too? Would you like any nicknames that I was once known by? My friends used to call me Skinny when I was younger. It's not bad. And my dad always called me that piece of shit. Afton jumped. She physically jumped as if someone would... That someone had snuck up behind her and made a farting noise with their tongue like this. It's a telephone that works over time. Stime. Stime and pace. They're my lawyers. Uh... I think that one will work for our belt, locker room belt. There we go. Brenda turned to Afton. Not an ounce of irony in our... F I don't know this irony. I, uh, ever since... <laughs> Your world frightens and confuses me. <laughs> that damn Alanis Morissette. I, I don't... Turns out the cold hadn't killed her, but the half bottle of sleeping pills she had swallowed at some point the previous night. 
That doesn't say night at all. Hmm. Hmm. But the half bottle of sleeping pills she had swallowed at some point the previous evening. Uh. Maybe we could use that one. <laughs> hey, Sabrina. Yes? Where are you right now? I'm in hell. <laughs> She went to the pimply-faced guy behind the counter. He smiled at her. Then he must have seen something in her eyes because he asked. Come on, pimply-faced guy, go. Is anything wrong? (laughs) Hey, you're ruining his focus. I was here yesterday. I talked to the manager about tracking down a dame. Dame. I'm tracking down a dame. The teen slinked off like a couple of Gila monsters. One called the owner a feminine hygiene product as they slipped out under the gate. Douche. The man glowered after them. Stupid kids, they'll be breaking into the change maker a year from now. He turned back to Afton, embarrassed by this. I'm sorry, honey. Sweat had gathered at his temples, and the girl felt sorry for him. That's okay, she said. I should be in school, too. Douche. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Mr. Sergeant went back into the room. The ar- <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, he went into the back room, didn't he? If you know what I'm saying. Hello, how are you? Have you been all right? Through all the lonely, 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 lonely nights? That's what I'd say. I'd tell you everything if you'd pick up that telephone. Electric light orchestra. Boop, 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 boop. I I don't think I could be intimate with a girl that didn't like that song. Yeah. Ahoy, hoy. (laughs) What the hell is that? (laughs) Was uh, from The Simpsons. That's how uh, Mr. Burns answers the phone. It's apparently like way back when they first invented phones, there was an argument between like Alexander Graham Bell and some other guy over what the best way to answer a phone is. One said it should be hello, and the other one said it should be ahoy, hoy. You know, I think so they like, always pull out that Mr. Byrne is the oldest guy alive stuff. I think my friend Matt, the guy that would get stoned at work all the time, told me that back then. That that's what that joke was about. But, but even then, Simpsons was totally dead, so I didn't. Uh, I see. Welcome to the Dune Steve October Scary... St- what the hell? Welcome to the Dune Steve... Audio... audio Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Do that one more time because I was still talking over you that time. Derek Palmer sleeps with a shillelagh and a baseball bat. Oh, that's Kevin Anderson. And he was born on Halloween and married on Halloween and died on Halloween. Took his own life on Halloween. I'm just saying with this particular twin, and sadly she was the only freak that I ever knew. Sadly, she was the only identical twin I ever knew. Uh Uh-huh. That's true, and if I was telling a story about that, I would just say it. Manchichi. Oh. Uh, oh, yes, Rumble, a giant queen. Oh, what was the name of the Autobot that would say, and away we go. Oh. He was a Lamborghini, a red Lamborghini. Sunstreaker? No, that was the yellow one, wasn't he? Well, the Autobots had Sideswipe and Sunstreaker, and of course the Dinobots. All of them were mincing jerk. Whoa, 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 hold on a second. You're not going to say that about Grimlock to me. Not to my face, man. Grimlock was tough. A bull queer. Oh, oh no. I don't know that we can you know, use any of this. Yeah, I think way. we may have to delete the... Soundwave? I didn't realize he was going to be such an offensive guest. No, no, wait. In in Soundwave's defense, just mentioning that someone is gay isn't... Well, maybe it is. Well, see, the problem is it's the whole perception. Now, if somebody knows that we're joking and having fun even if they're gay, they laugh along. But if somebody, even if they're straight, wants to be offended, they will be. You know what I mean? Right. Okay, well, at least I didn't use the word fudge packer. Oh, you just did. Crap. Perceptor was a giant fudge packer. <laughs> I had just seen Armageddon, and I mean, unless you're, you also hated that movie. I, well, I kind of have to cut out this can, whole episode. You can just bleep a lot of bleeps. That's what we can do. Just bleep a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the, the, that's the, that's the way that, around it. That uh, 
that Soundwave says. Maybe too. Soundwave can say he was a beep. But you haven't seen the second movie, right? No. But there's a Decepticon that can transform into a hot chick, and are you serious? Like a hot robot chick, or no, like like a human being, hot chick that goes to his college and. They actually have a Decepticon transform into a girl, enroll in his school, and go to his classes. And you're just like, well, where's the logic in that? And I assume that it's to kill him. But yeah, just transform into a gun or a bomb or a backhoe and kill him rather than a hot chick. But yeah, again, it's like, okay, this thing turning into a car, I can believe. (laughs) But a Transformer turning into Isabel Lucas, I'm afraid I'm not able to... uh, did you see this movie? No, I didn't. And I, I shan't. And you're drooling, you're <laughs> slobbering. She's a handsome woman, though. She was in this movie Daybreakers that I saw earlier this year. And <laughs> Did you see what came up as the suggestion? Megan <laughs> Fox, no, no clothes. clothes. <laughs> That's funny. This chick was so hot in Daybreakers that it distracted from the the plot of the movie. Every time she was on there, I'd be like, ah, come on! No, that that can't be. Dude, this is like a post-apocalyptic movie. Nothing could look like that. We still recording? Sexy chocolate!